there is certainly a greater awareness of mental health issues in Singapore. We launched a national mental health and well-being strategy early in October, which also happened to be the month designated globally for mental health awareness. Then, on November 20th, a network of well-being champions was launched to help firms support the mental health of their employees. But the question is whether we, as a people, are really changing our approach and attitudes towards mental health, or even having honest discussions about it with a view to changing our own behaviours. I think we still have a long way to go. In fact, at most companies and schools, there was barely a peep about mental wellness in October. It probably didn't help that October also happens to be the month for pre-university exams, although I would argue that made it even more timely to highlight the importance of mental well-being to adolescents and youth. I would, in fact, add that our young people and our workers, two large groups that cover a large segment of our population, are the ones who could do with more urgent attention when it comes to mental health. Various surveys bear this out, so it is worth looking at what we can do to help these two groups. The National Population Health Survey revealed that one in four young adults aged 18 to 29 is suffering from poor mental health, making them the most vulnerable group among us. More worryingly, a separate study of young people aged 10 to 18 conducted by the National University of Singapore suggested at least one in 10 teenagers would meet a clinical diagnosis for a mental disorder. In a fast-paced society like Singapore, the constant focus on results and productivity has taken a toll on our teens and working adults. Just think about the relentless tuition and the rise of school holiday internships for school-going youth to increase their marketability. Working adults, on the other hand, face the pressure of meeting performance targets in a culture where prompt responses are now mistaken for efficiency and productivity. Mental health is what we in public health would consider a wicked problem. It is hard to define, it has many drivers, and the solutions are difficult to pin down because they are so varied. Nevertheless, it is an issue we need to tackle head-on. There is no clear consensus on what poor mental health means. Some experts prefer to focus on a clinical definition of mental disorders that affect cognition, emotion, and behavior, which fundamentally impair normal mental functioning, whereas the World Health Organization, who defines it as an inability to cope with the stresses of life and to realize one's potential. In fact, who explicitly states that mental health is more than the absence of mental disorders. The problem with medicalizing the definition of poor mental health is that this will downplay the scale of the problem. Given that half of diabetics in Singapore do not even know of their own diabetes status illustrates how precarious the situation is if we have to rely on individuals to come forward themselves to get their health status clinically verified before someone can intervene. That is why it is important to empower individuals to recognize signs of poor mental health. Hence, I will use WHO's definition of poor mental health, which I see as fundamentally linked to the feeling of vulnerability. Where a person may experience recurrent bouts of anxiety or stress, or feel suffocated, helpless and hopeless. Notice that the key words such as feeling, experience and sense are linked to vulnerabilities that an individual perceives, and these require no affirmation from anyone else for them to be legitimate. Just the fact that an individual feels distressed should be enough for us to accept it. The root causes of poor mental health can vary considerably across segments. Poor mental health among adolescents and youth is likely to be driven by the perception of inadequacies and the innate desire to feel protected. They feel inadequate when they compare themselves with their peers, or even against what they see on social media. Some romanticize the lifestyles and habits of influencers and try to emulate them to garner approval or likes. Studies have shown there is a link 
between feeling inadequate and the amount of time spent on social media platforms. These studies also show that social comparison, dissatisfaction with one's appearance, and the fear of missing out are direct risk factors for emotional distress, mental disorders and lower emotional stability. And because adolescents and youth increasingly rely on their digital identities to form connections, they are also more vulnerable when their digital self faces bullying or discriminatory and stigmatizing behavior. Worse still, hurtful and distressing content can continue online, even after a person has disengaged physically from the aggressors. Separately, mental health has worsened in the past three years for adults in the age band of 30 to 59. These are mainly working adults struggling to stay relevant and competent at the workplace. Technology such as emails, online conferencing platforms and even instant messaging on smartphones has created a pervasive work environment that does not respect time, location and space. Nighttime, weekends and holidays have lost their protective aura where one could legitimately disconnect and disengage from work. Since when did we as a society agree to the culture of checking and responding to non-urgent work communications? Even when at home or on a holiday. I have heard first-hand accounts of how a manager would send an email at 10 p.m., followed by another chaser at 7 a.m. asking why he hadn't received a reply. And of the globetrotting boss, who expects the secretary to stay contactable during his travel time zone. Leadership and management holding retreats on weekends inadvertently normalize the culture that it is acceptable for weekends to be exploited for exigencies. This cascades down the entire management chain, and the middle management no longer distinguishes between what is urgent enough to require weekend work and what is just routine and mundane. Individuals, corporations and society have to join hands to squarely tackle the root causes of poor mental health among the different groups of people who have been hurt. It's precisely because the solutions are so varied that seals this as a wicked problem. For the individual, this starts from the recognition that something is amiss, whether in terms of emotions, thoughts or behavior, of increasing anxiety or the sense of losing control. Family and friends can play an important role here by observing whether a person is behaving abnormally or is uncharacteristically lethargic or consistently failing to react. Reaching out quickly can not only arrest any downward spiral, but also explore and tackle the root causes of this situation. The young, for example, can make an explicit commitment to limit their social media access and stay away from platforms that trigger the feeling of inferiority. Competition or stress. For a start, we can stop the constant worship of influencers and their unrealistic lifestyles. Setting boundaries can also moderate our expectations of ourselves. By not overcommitting to what we are unlikely to be able to cope with or deliver on. Individuals find their own method of escape from such stresses, be it by enjoying the outdoors or true art. Music or reading. And don't forget a routine to eat properly, exercise regularly and sleep adequately to provide the stability required by the human brain. Mental resilience is as much about the support network as it is about establishing a regular pace of life and being able to escape from pressure. Meanwhile, there is a need for families and schools to teach the young to express their emotions more openly and transparently, and for parents and teachers to actually learn to listen and respond appropriately. They need to reinforce a child's self-belief and provide guidance when required. Companies need to take a hard look at their work cultures. They need to see if there is a fundamental culture of respect for their workers and stamp out unsavory work practices. Do employers and management truly internalize the promotion of a healthy work-life balance by cutting back on needless work activities after official hours? Or are they simply paying lip service to mental wellness? 
increasing organizational productivity and efficiency should never be explored with inadequate human resources or simply expecting everyone to put in more effort. Do our own actions contribute to the poor mental health of others? Are we mindful of our own? Do we remind ourselves to stay away from our devices for at least a certain period each day? For the leaders among us, do we truly walk the talk and enforce a culture of genuine respect throughout the organization, or do we care only about our own mental well-being and remain intentionally ignorant of what is happening down the management chain? Do we accord the same level of patience and courtesy to our family members as we are wont to do to our bosses and clients? And most importantly, do we reach out for help when we feel unable to cope? Or do we choose to suffer in silence? It is only by asking and answering these questions that we can put this wicked problem to rest.